tell you, when they got to that part there, the bridge there, when they said the trumpet's going to sound, I, about, I had to shift in my chair. Did you all see that? I had to shift around just a little bit. I was about to come up out of there. Praise the Lord. Uh, Pastor Rick, a few minutes ago, mentioned that, that verse I talked about a little kid. And this child can face uncertain days because he lives... And I was thinking the exact same thing when, when you guys were singing that. I was thinking about when my, when my kids were born and when Cody was born. and The world that he's going to grow up in is completely different than the world that I grew up in. But I know because of Jesus Christ, because he lives, he can face those uncertain days. I've been doing a lot of reflection, it seems like, lately. I, and I'm not real for sure why. Um, yesterday... Um, as many of you guys know there, there was a wedding here Amos and Heidi got married and uh, it seemed like every portion of that wedding sort of reminded me of, of our wedding I'll, I will never forget and I told Amos this I said you need to make sure that you pay attention when she walks through those doors because that will be the most beautiful that you will ever see your wife in your entire life and Heidi came walking through those doors and it just brought me back to when Amanda came through those doors, you know, at Elmwood's where we got married at, actually. And then, and then each step of the way, you know, whenever Charlie uh, led, led Heidi and, and Tess led Heidi up here, I could just picture, um, you know, whenever Jerry and, and, and Jeremy and, and, and Deb, and it, just, it just brought me back to those moments. And... Um, you know, guys, weddings are beautiful, they're joyous, they're, they're fun, they're, they're great occasions. But I can't help but wonder how many times that a family has experienced that joy and then five years later, the marriage is dissolved. They've watched their bride come through the door and then a few years later, there's, there, there's nothing. Um... Last night, I, I shifted gears. I, I, I was going to bring a different message today, and um, last night I decided against that. So I want you to flip with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And what I want to do this morning is I want to continue pretty much where we left off last week. Last week, we were dealing with the Christian relationship that exists uh, within the family, and last week the message was mainly geared towards fathers, but today I want to speak to both husbands and to wives regarding the subject of marriage. Um, this week, uh, actually last night, I found a study that was conducted by Lifeway researchers that was entitled The Top Ten Issues Facing Today's Family and Marriages. I just want to read this for you briefly. Um, the survey is entitled Top 10 Issues Facing Today's Family and the Marriage. Number one issue is an anti-Christian culture. Number two is divorce. Number three, busyness. Jam-packed schedule. Does anybody know what that's like? Have a jam-packed schedule? Number four, the absence of a father figure. Number five, the lack of discipline. I think that ought to be higher up on the list. Number six, financial pressures. Number seven, lack of communication. Number eight, negative media influences. Number nine, the balance of work and family. Does anybody struggle with that? Okay. Number 10, materialism. Now, let me say this. I agree with every single one of those issues. I agree that every single one of those things are problems within the family and within the marriage. But I want to make this as simple and clear cut for you as I possibly can this morning. The biggest problem that's facing the family and the biggest problem that's facing marriages today 
It's not necessarily any of those things that I just listed in that survey. The number one problem is the lack of Jesus Christ within the family and the lack of Jesus Christ within the marriage. Now, folks, let me make something clear. There are probably people that maybe has been through a divorce and they went to church. Just because you go to church every Sunday and every Wednesday does not mean that you have Jesus Christ in the middle of your marriage. Let me also make this clear. You can have Jesus Christ in the middle of your marriage, especially one party, one individual, and the other individual strays from that. And then things can happen. So I don't want you to think by any stretch of the imagination that I'm singling out an individual here this morning. I want you to look down at Colossians chapter 3 and I want to read for you verse 17, 18 and 19 the scripture says this and whatsoever you do in word or deed do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God and the Father by him wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord husbands love your wives and be not bitter against them let's pray father we thank you dear lord for the time the day the opportunity that we have to join hands together as a family as a body in christ and father we want to thank you for that body we want to thank you for this family and father we ask you that you would protect this family father that you would lead us and that you would guide us that you would protect us father that you would uh, protect us from the the schemes of the evil one father we pray that today would be a bad day for him father we pray that today that that the word of God would go forth that you would receive glory that it would find lodging in the hearts and lives of men women boys and girls father we pray that today would be the day of salvation father we pray that we can take something from this word doesn't matter for a husband doesn't matter for a wife father this words for everyone and father we pray that you would get glory from it. We love you, we thank you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray, and amen. Guys, let me say, it is no accident that the Apostle Paul, if you look down there at verse number 17, it's no accident what he says there in that verse just before he goes into the relationship between a husband and a wife. Notice what he says. He says, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. You see, this verse describes how marriage and how the family is supposed to function. The main purpose of God's people is to glorify God. The main purpose in a marriage is to glorify God. Jesus Christ is to be the foundation, is to be the centerpiece of the relationship between one man and one woman. Let me make that clear, amen? This is God's original design for marriage. I want you to understand right out of the gate this morning that God established this covenant. We live in a society, folks, where everyone is downplayed the importance of marriage. Folks, we've turned something, we turn marriage into something that it's not. We've turned marriage into just a piece of paper. We've devalued marriage. We've degraded marriage all the way to the point where it's become meaningless in our society. Marriage is supposed to be a sacrificial and permanent bond between a man and a woman. Listen to me, it is a creation ordinance. The Bible says this, and the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. Folks, listen. When God brought Eve to Adam at that very moment, whenever he did that, that's when the covenant was established. That's when the ordinance was created. We need to realize that marriage is not a social contract between a man and a woman, but this covenant is the foundation of the family, and the family is the building block to any society that has ever thrived or any society that has ever existed. It's no wonder Satan's attacking the family. Because that's the building block. That's where Satan wants to go. Satan wants to get inside of your home. He wants to get to your spouse. He wants to get to your children. But since God created this covenant, God also gave marriage an order. 
When God ordained marriage and designed the family, he created an order. He created a chain of command. And I want to be very upfront with you and clear that this has nothing to do with who is in charge. So let me just get that out of the way. I think most of us know that there is equality found at the foot of the cross. There's equality in the redemption of Jesus Christ. Look up at verse 11 in Colossians chapter 3. The Bible says there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. There's a parallel passage of that over in Galatians chapter 3 that says this, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, but you are all one in Christ Jesus. So we are all equal in Christ. However, God still established a structure within the marriage. It's the exact same thing that we see within the Trinity. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three persons are equally God. But the Holy Ghost submits to the Son, and the Son submits to the Father. Folks, there's no competition in this. There's no rivalry in this. And I want to show you this. Flip over to John chapter 14. Hold your place in Colossians 3. But I want you to see this. I think it's important. John chapter 14. Once you've made it, say, I made it. You have heard how I said unto you, this is Jesus speaking, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I go unto the Father. Notice the next phrase. For my Father is greater than I. Folks, this is called uh, the subordination of Jesus Christ. He was equal to the Father, but he took a submissive role unto the Father. In Philippians chapter 2, we can see this as plain as day. The Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You can go into John chapter 20 and verse 17. And Jesus said, Touch me not, for I am not ascended to my Father, but I go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and to your God. You see, this is the submissive role of Jesus Christ. He submitted himself to God the Father. Did that somehow remove his deity? Absolutely not, it didn't. Did that somehow make him uh, less than God? Absolutely it did not. But he submitted unto the Father. I want you to see how the Holy Ghost submitted unto the Son. Flip over to John chapter 15. John 15, should be one page. If you haven't made it, say, I haven't made it. <laughs> Pastor Rick. All right, he's just kidding. John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, the Comforter being the Holy Spirit, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, look at this, he shall testify of me. You see, the Holy Spirit of God does not testify of himself. He has a submissive role. Everything that he does, Richard, he points it to Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because he has submitted himself unto the Son. He submitted himself unto the Father. Flip over to John chapter 16. Look there at verse 13. It says, How about when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you in all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever you shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. This is Jesus speaking of the Spirit. The Spirit is going to glorify him. The Spirit is not going to glorify his self. For he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you all things that the Father have are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. This does not mean that one is greater than the other. They are equally the same. But it simply means that one has submitted themselves to the other, and this is the order that God has designed, and it's the exact same way within the marriage. Amen? We can see that in 1 Corinthians. The Bible says, I would have you know, and I want you to pay attention to this because I'm getting somewhere, I promise. But I would have you know 
that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Did you guys catch that? God, Christ, man. I'm sorry, ladies. Woman. Does that somehow mean that we are not equal? No, it does not. Traditionalism, traditionalism will tell you that it does. But listen, folks, nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Challenge me on it. The word head means source. In marriage, listen to me, the husband and the wife are equal before God, but there is, listen, this is important, there is an order of authority. Okay, we're equal in Christ. There is a structure. There is an order of authority. The wife, even though she is equal, is to voluntarily, okay, as did Jesus, submit herself to the husband as the husband has submitted himself to Christ and the husband is to love his wife as Christ has loved the church. That's the role of the wife. That is the role of the husband. That's the model that we've been given. Are you guys with me so far? I can tell this is a little intense. I've seen some people kind of shifting in their seats. All right. Listen, marriage is a covenant that not only God created, not only is there an order, but, is an, but it is also a covenant that must, must, must include God. It's got to have Jesus Christ in the center of it. You see, the covenant of marriage, folks, it has to have God. You cannot leave him out of the equation. Now, there's a parallel passage to Colossians chapter 3. It's over in Ephesians chapter 5. Flip there with me. Ephesians chapter 5. This is something known as the Spirit-filled life. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5. It begins there in verse number 18. Whenever Paul says, but be filled with the Spirit. If you see that, say amen. Then he goes on to say, speaking to yourselves in psalms, in hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to the other in the fear of God. Look at the next verse. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Look down at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Flip back to Colossians chapter 3. He begins this section in verse number 16. Look here carefully. This is important. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Does it sound familiar? We just read that in Ephesians. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. The very next verse, look at it. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as, as it is fit in the Lord. Look at verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Here's what I want to point out. Notice the key of marriage. In Colossians, he begins that section between the husband and the wife with the phrase, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's not by accident. Then he goes in and he talks about the role of the husband and the wife. Are you guys with me? In Ephesians, he begins by saying, be filled with the Spirit, right before he goes in and begins to talk about husbands and wives. Folks, here's my point. If we do not allow the Word of Christ to dwell in our marriage richly, if we are not filled with the Holy Spirit of God in our marriages, folks, then your marriage is going to be headed for destruction. There's a reason that he makes these statements right before he goes in and talks about the husband and the wife. Folks, if, if a spirit-filled life and the word of Christ does not exist within our marriage, then our marriage is going to struggle. It's probably going to fail. There's going to be division within that marriage. There will be no unity within that marriage. And folks, in God, he established the marriage to have unity. Amen? The husband and the wife are to function as one person. I read this passage yesterday during the wedding. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and they shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be 
one. One flesh. You see, the marriage is supposed to be a team. There's supposed to be unity within the marriage. Folks, if a marriage is not functioning together, then there is trouble coming around the corner. But we see marriages all the time where we have individuals that are functioning independently of their spouse, sleeping in different beds. Now, now listen, I understand when you get older and you, you don't want to hear somebody snore or something like that. Listen, I get it. But I'm talking right out of newlywed. Sleeping in different beds, separate bank accounts, separate vacation, separate absolutely everything. They're functioning independently from one another. You guys understand what I'm talking about, right? You see, that right there, folks, is not good. A house divided against itself cannot stand, Jesus said. Now, here's what I want to do. I want you to look down at verse number 18. All, pr pretty much all that's by way of introduction. <laughs> Amen? Amen? All right, you guys in shock. <laughs> you haven't seen anything yet. All right, look at verse number 18. <laughs> Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Let me say this. You will never understand submission until you first submitted yourself to Jesus Christ. You're never going to understand, ladies, what it means to, to submit yourself unto your husband until first you understand what it means to submit yourself to Jesus Christ. Submitting means to give every single bit of yourself. All of it. 100%. It means to yield to another individual. It means the respecting of another person. Folks, this does not mean that you submit to your husband the exact same way that you submit to Jesus Christ because after all, Jesus Christ was perfect and your husband is also not perfect. <laughs> right? I heard some amen from the women. Listen, the wife was created to be a helper Adam did not pick her and you know what I love that I, I may think that I picked Amanda it didn't happen you see God gave her to me God created Eve and he brought her unto Adam the wife is meant to be a helper. The wife is meant to assist the husband. Understand this. Biblical authority is never given for the advantage of the one that is in the position of the authority. It's not given so that I can have the advantage over my spouse. Biblical authority is put in place for blessing and the protection of those that are underneath the authority. Folks, that, that's extreme. Extremely, extremely important. Wives, you're to submit yourselves unto the leadership of your husband. Why? It's for your blessing. It's for your benefit. It's for your protection. That's the way that God has designed this thing. That does not mean that the husband gets to make every single decision. But it does mean, husband, you're going to be held accountable and responsible for everything that happens and every decision that happens within that family. God is going to hold the dad, the, the father, the husband responsible. Amen? Are you guys with me on that? You see, folks, oftentimes the marriage becomes a big competition. Or, I mean, at least I can say that. You, you, you guys are like, eh, we, don't, we don't have that. I can remember when our children were born, there was a competition on who could get sleep. And if somebody walked through the house and saw someone else taking a nap, it'd be like, <clears throat> uh, what are you doing? You ain't taking a nap. Uh-uh. If I can't take a nap, then you can't take a nap. You see, that's what happens. Y'all understand? competition all of a sudden starts going on inside the house. If I can't have it, you can't have it. If I can't do it, you can't do it. Folks, marriage is not supposed to be a competition. That's not the way that God has intended for this thing to be. Now I want you to notice the end of this verse. The scripture says, wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands, but notice this, as it is fit in the Lord. As it is fit in the Lord. This has got to be the framework. This has got to be the foundation 
of everything that's within the marriage because the wife can never be asked to submit unto sin. If your husband is asking you to do something that does not line up with the word of God, then you need to take a stand against that. Amen? The scripture says, as it is fit in the Lord. So wives, this should be pretty clear. What is your role? Submit yourselves unto your husbands. Husbands, look at verse 19. Now here it's going to get a little intense. It's always harder on husbands than it is on the wives. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Just like a wife's submission to her husband is evidence to her submission to Jesus Christ, it's the same thing with the husband's love for his wife giving evidence to his relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, the relationship between the husband and the wife, folks, it ought to be a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word love that's used there, it's the Greek word agape. It means to literally put yourself to the side for the benefit of someone else. Husbands, you're supposed to put what you want and what you desire to the side for your wife, for her benefit. How many times have I done what I want to do? I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of of pushing my spouse to the side so that I can get what I want. I have done that. That's completely against what the Word of God tells me to do. The Word of God tells me I'm to love her the exact same way that Jesus Christ has loved the church. How did he love the church? He gave himself for the church. He died. He left the best of heaven. He came to this earth, born of a virgin. He went to a cross. He shed his blood. He gave everything that he had for the church. That's you. He gave it all. I I wonder how many spouse uh, or uh, uh, husbands, I wonder how many husbands are here today that can honestly say that they've given it all for their wife. There's none of us because none of us are perfect, remember? You see, but that's what he expects. That's God's standard. But praise God, Jesus Christ went to the cross because we cannot live up to that standard. Folks, if we could live up to that standard, then Jesus Christ died in vain. He had, it was pointless for him to even go. So the husband and the wife are to reflect the same characteristics as of Jesus Christ. You say, what are those characteristics? Look at verse 12 through 14 in Colossians 3. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a core against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye, and above all these things, put on love. How many times have we gone to bed mad? How many times have we hold a grudge for a day? How many times we hold a grudge for a week? It continued to go on and on and on. And husbands, you have got to quit holding your wives to a standard that cannot be reached. Constantly finding fault, constantly nagging about something, constantly complaining about something. Constantly. I see it. I've done it. Folks, you cannot hold your wife to a standard that she cannot get to. Some of us are not happy unless we're nagging and picking on some little tiny nitpicking thing and then we won't even let it go. That's not the way that he has intended this thing to work. He's intended it for wives to submit themselves as Christ has submitted himself to the Father and husbands, you're to love your wife the way that he has loved the church. You're to give absolutely everything for her. Over in Ephesians, the Bible says this, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. So men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loveth himself, for no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it, cherishes it, even as the Lord, the church. You see, the husband's role is to see the wife flourish in verse 26 and 27. 
That's our role. We want our wife to, to actually flourish, to, to, to go ahead of us. Verse 28, we're to love our wives more than we love our own bodies. Did anybody spend any time in the mirror this morning? I know you guys take care of your bodies. I mean, you got up and bathed. I mean, I hope. I hope you got up and took a bath and brushed your teeth. I mean, you take care of your body. You see, we're supposed to love our wives. The Scripture says more than that. I mean, look at the great lengths that we go to to take care of ourselves, Ron. We're supposed to love our wives way beyond that. It's a serious call, isn't it? It's a difficult call. And what it requires is for us to remove ourself out of the equation and to, and to let Christ be, be the center of everything that we do. Are you giving yourself 100% to your wife? Are you sacrificing for your wife? You see, when a marriage functions the way that God has intended it to function, folks, it's going to flourish. But it also has a purpose. And you know what that purpose is? It's to glorify God, it, but it's also to be a witness. You know why? Because the world is watching. Folks, there's no greater witness for the gospel of Jesus Christ than a marriage that has lasted for 40, 50, 60 years. Because when people look at that, they say, oh my goodness gracious. Is there anybody here today that's been married for 40 years? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What about 50? What about 60? What about 65? So 60, Betty and Ralph? How many? 62 years. <laughs> Folks, a marriage does not last 62 years without somebody laying their personal wants to the side. Without pushing self out of the equation. A 62-year marriage is a picture of the gospel, the way that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You see, what is the church's response to that? What's the church's response to the fact that Jesus Christ gave his all? We submit to it. That's what the church does. We have a submissive, a, a submissive role, and folks, we come with joy. It's the same thing at the heart of the Christian marriage. It's the exact same way, folks. It ought to be a picture of the gospel. When a wife submits her, herself unto her husband, the wife is displaying the way a believer is supposed to submit to Christ. Whenever a husband loves his wife the way that Christ loved the church, it's a picture of Calvary. And guess what? The world is seeing that. The world sees the divorce rates in the church. It's one I see all the time. It drives me absolutely crazy. It's the first thing they want to point out. Folks, we need to understand. We need to understand the importance of marriage, and we need to understand that people are watching. They're watching that. But folks, before you can do anything, let me, t let me just tell you this. I was saved. I was baptized when I was 11 years old. Man and I got married right out of high school. I've told you guys many times that we lived our lives in a backslidden condition for several years. I want to tell you the last 10 years of our marriage whenever Jesus Christ has been in the center, and I mean the center of it, at the very forefront of it, our marriage has flourished. Big time. And it wasn't necessarily that we had a bad marriage before, right? 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 Say yes. <laughs> hey, it just wasn't where it needed to be. You guys understand what I'm saying? It wasn't where it needed to be. You know if Jesus Christ is at the very center of your marriage. If you want a successful and healthy marriage, then Christ has got to be in the middle of it, but you first got to get yourself right. Let me tell you this in closing. You can't change your spouse. You can't do it. 
You're not going to change your wife. I cannot change Amanda. She's hard headed. You cannot change your husband. She can't change me. I'm hard headed. But listen, you can change yourself with the power of the Holy Spirit of God dwelling inside of you. You make sure that you're doing what the Scripture has laid out. Husbands, you make sure you're fulfilling your God-given role. Wives, you make sure that you're fulfilling your God-given role. And then guess what? All of a sudden, Christ is going to be in the middle of your marriage, and all of a sudden, your marriage is going to take off, Tom. One amen. <laughs> Listen to this. Ecclesiastes 4.12. If one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. How many? But a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Husband, wife, what's the third one? Jesus. Folks, if you want your relationship, if you want your marriage to flourish, you've got to have it. That's what's lacking in our society today. It's lacking from the family. It's lacking from the marriage. But you know what? Let me tell you something else, just real quick. It's not taught on enough. It's not preached on enough. But at Bloomingdale, man, we got some great examples. 62 years. Harold, how many years? 60. Richard and Anita, how many? 50. 50 this year? Oh, that's a biggie. If, if you make it three more weeks. Look at Rich. <laughs> Ron and Donna, how, how long? 51 this year, wow. Young couples like myself, we've been married 20 years coming up, and even younger couples, praise God, we have an example. Let me say this. Folks, you've got to get yourself right. If you don't have Jesus Christ in the center of your marriage, today I want you to get him in the center of your heart. He'll flip your world upside down. He'll flip your relationships upside down. But folks, you've got to get him in there. You've got to serve him. That doesn't mean everything's going to be roses. It, folks, there's going to be some thorns. You're going to fall. Sometimes things are going to happen. But you know what? He's going to be with you every single step of the way. Amen? Let's all rise.